So, um, so everybody, uh, welcome to our Cornell City uh, Financial Data Science Seminar. And I'm really excited to have Laura Leal today, who is uh, going to talk about learning a functional control for high frequency finance. So uh, Laura is a last year PhD student at, um, at Princeton. And, uh, and yeah, I've, I've been following her work with a, a lot of attention and, and she has some very novel uh, approaches that uh, I'm sure you all will be excited to hear. So uh, just um, as questions pop up, please add, put them in the Q&A um, or the chat room. And then I'll, uh, you know, as I see fit, I'll either, you know, ask them in the middle if it's a very, sort of timely question or I'll keep it for the end uh, if it's a more general question. So, so Laura, great to have you and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sasha. And thanks for the very generous introduction. Uh, so thanks for coming everyone. Um, today I'll be presenting first paper on my thesis, uh, which is learning a functional control for high frequency finance. And here, uh, this is joint work with Mathieu Laurier and Charles Belleal, which are both great co-authors. So, um, just okay. So this in this talk, we have um, a trader, and they want to either buy or sell a very large amount of stocks in a certain amount of time. Of course, if they do it all at the same time, uh, like let's dump it in the market, they'll they'll make huge losses for the firm and they'll be fired next day and probably the SEC was well, it's gonna come after them. So we need to solve this problem in a, in a better way than just dumping. That creates the necessity of uh, an optimal execution uh, problem. So we don't wanna have that large market impact. We wanna be as smooth as possible uh, in terms of being stealth. So we want to not be identified uh, when we trade, especially because uh, other players are going to trade against us. So we solve this problem using deep neural networks. Um, and the idea here is that we have a stochastic optimization problem. It's usually solved by uh, a PD method. So we find first order conditions, which have a closed form solution for very specific parameters, uh, which make the problem solvable. And once we get rid of these, uh, all of these assumptions, we can no longer solve them. But with the neural network, we can. So we make the problem more realistic and we wanna create an approximation to the solution that is still uh, something that the agent can use to trade. The problem with neural networks is always that people say, oh, well, it's a black box. Uh, how, how am I going to explain this to a client? Uh, do I have to set margin for it? So here we provide the idea of explainability. So it's going beyond uh, model distillation in the sense that uh, once we explain the neural network, we're not going to use uh, the distilled model. So we're not going to use the simple version of the model. We're still going to use the neural network solution to trade. Um, the difference here is that we'll understand better the risk that this new solution is bringing. So we have this idea of projecting the neural network control onto a lower dimensional manifold or, or a, a simpler space um, that on which the known solution lies and we want to know how far away this neural network solution is from from what everyone is used to so by everyone i mean risk sectors regulators everyone should be very comfortable with using neural networks for trading and then we of course we want to know are we actually improving uh, our performance so we look at uh, the value function the wealth mark to market and of course the relative errors in our projections. And okay, so we propose um, the neural network solution, which we benchmark against the classic closed form PD solution. And then 
we noticed that the neural network can give us so much more in terms of uh, more realistic execution schemes. And um, so we improve um, on the type of data characteristics that we can use. For example, uh, sometimes high frequency data has some autocorrelation, the neural network can learn that. Uh, of course, financial data has heavy tails, it has intraday seasonality. So the neural network can react to all of that while the PD solution uh, really has uh, a hard time doing it. Um, the only problem with the neural network solution is that the neural network takes a long time to run. So uh, while the PD does not, it's like a second. So the way we solve this problem is by proposing a multi-preference controller. What this means is that the neural network is not only going to take as inputs uh, the usual time and state variables, it's also going to take as inputs uh, the risk preferences of the agent. So if a new day starts, you do not have to wake up at 4 a.m. to train your neural network to adapt to the new um, risk aversion parameters of the agent of that specific day. Instead, you will have trained on many sets of parameters. And once you, you have a new day coming in, you just use that as input to the network and you're good to go. So the outline for the presentation, uh, I'll quickly go through the literature. So it's, we're in the intersection of a lot of different branches. So uh, I'll skim through. Uh, then I'll, for those not as familiar with the optimal execution model, I'll explain the structure of this model in some detail, and then explain how the neural network control works, uh, numerical results in terms of explainability and all the performances, and finally, uh, the conclusion. So we're in the intersection of, of course, optimal execution, um, which is uh, where the motivation for our problem comes from. But we also draw from more general uh, literatures in, in learning, reinforcement learning, and deep learning techniques. And I want to give a huge shout out to the deep learning techniques here uh, because um, their seminal papers, they, they represent uh, approximations to PDs. And we took inspiration from that to, instead of approximate, approximating the PDEs, which are uh, the first order conditions for our problem, we'll be approximating one level up. So we'll be directly approximating uh, the solution to the stochastic optimization problem. So once given an objective function and dynamics, we don't need uh, to derive a PD, we don't need to derive um, anything from that, the neural network will directly learn the solution given the structure of the problem. And then if you're a trader, you only need to, your only task is then to, well, am I defining the problem in the correct manner? Once you do that, everything else is uh, solved for you. Okay, so the optimal execution model uh, is the following. So you wanna either buy or sell, so you're one directional, but of course, uh, during the day, if the opportunity is good, you can go the other way. Um, so if you're buying, you can be selling for a little while if it's profitable, otherwise you just go one direction. So here we do not impose that they sh the trader should go in only one direction, although you could include this constraint because some, some firms have this mandate. So uh, as for state variables, we have the inventory. So here you'll notice that I'm writing it in discrete time. I'll write it in, in continuous time soon to show the closed form uh, for the PD, but for now, bear with me. So we have the control, which is the speed of trading. Uh, and so here, this means for a given time step, let's say five minutes, uh, if I trade faster, I'm gonna accumulate inventory faster. And then I have the price. So I just wanna make one remark. Here, uh, this is a time differentiable function. Uh, in a subsequent paper with Professor Carmona, as I was telling uh, Sasha, we actually proposed that 
we should include Brownian components here uh, based on looking at the data. So the price process uh, evolves in the following way. So we have a drift component that is affected by the speed of trading of the agent, so by the control. Uh, and this generates a permanent market impact on the price. So the faster you're trading here, let's say you're buying, you're pushing the price up. And we have um, a drift, uh, sorry, <laughs> the fusion components uh, that in this case, we're, we're just considering it to be uh, like Monte Carlo generated increments, but we'll see later that when using real data, this doesn't have to um, follow the structure of having um, normal zero one noise or we don't, we don't need any assumptions on this diffusion term. Finally, the wealth, it's a little, bit, a little more convoluted. So the wealth will evolve according to the speed of trading, but in a quadratic form. And it, so the intuition here is that we're pushing the, the amount that we have to pay, the faster we trade. So let's say we're trading super fast here. From, starting from our midpoint, we'll be having uh, the effect of crossing the spread. And the faster we trade, the more liquidity we're going to consume on the other side of the book. So we're going to be pushing our price uh, to one of the sides. So if you're buying, you're going to be, be pushing the price that you're going to pay up and therefore you're going to have temporary market impact on on the limit order book so this assumes that we only have market orders this this does not take into account limit orders okay so as you can see like the faster you trade um, the more you're going to have to pay to execute that trade so ideally, you don't want to trade super fast, but if your mandate is to trade very in a very uh, small amount of time, then you will need to pay that fast. So our objective criterion to minimize, uh, it depends on the control. So of course, that's the speed of trading. And it has a terminal component and a so terminal component and a running cost component. So the terminal cost we can break down in three parts. So the final wealth, that's in cash, plus um, how much we can sell our final inventory for. And here we're assuming that we can execute everything at the last um, moment, let's say in, in the final auction. Uh, and we have a penalty for holding inventory. So this is here because we wanna make sure uh, that the agent wants, strongly wants to execute by the end of the day. So if they're not penalized, they'll just keep it for the next day. And this is controlled by both uh, a risk aversion parameter A and by gamma, which, um, which I'll, I'll explain later um, how it comes in. But keep in mind that gamma is very important um, for our neural network solution. And finally, the running costs, um, it's a penalty for holding inventory throughout the day. So instead of being able to wait until the very last minute to execute, uh, given a risk version parameter gamma, uh, sorry, phi, the agent needs to be executing throughout the day. And these two parameters, A and phi, they're very important for risk management because uh, they will accelerate or they will slow down the execution of the order. So this is something that is based on, on the personal preference of a firm. And we, we, while we don't have that information explicitly, we can have a range of these parameters uh, to train on. So this is what we do. We, we set a range of, of, of pairs, A and phi, and we're gonna train the neural network for all of these. And going back to gamma, so usually in the literature, gamma is taken equal to two. So this would 
give us a, a quadratic uh, objective function, and this would be very close to a linear quadratic problem. If we set gamma to a more realistic parameter, we can no longer solve it in closed form. Uh, and that's where the neural network comes in because the neural network can learn uh, this approximation with parameter gamma. And of course, we're looking for optimal control, which outputs how much we should be trading at, at each time t starting from the beginning of the day until the end of, of the trading period. Okay, so here we have looked at the discrete time problem. We are going to benchmark it against a continuous time solution in, in a discretized form. So in a continuous time model, we have the same structure, so the same objective, uh, same dynamics, but here, of course, everything is in continuous time. So we have the integral, and we have the ds, the q, the x. Um, and our value function, uh, we want to maximize for our control. This is easily solvable. So the first order condition is a hamilton jacobi bellman equation uh, with terminal, um, terminal condition written here. And of course, we want to maximize it for the control. If we assume gamma equals to 2, we can solve this equation uh, by, by setting ansatz. So we assume that the value function has some quadratic term on the inventory. And that is, that is an, an ansat that comes from uh, our objective function. Since it's quadratic, we set this ansat as quadratic as well. But the important thing to remember here is that once we solve this problem, we have an optimal control that is a linear function of the inventory. Right? So we have. Uh, an intercept term and a slope term times the inventory function. So here we're only depending on one state variable for the control. And we can solve this, this, this problem by solving the ODE system. So this is a Riccati equation. This is a, a simple ODE and, and it's very easy to solve. But the important thing I want you to remember is we have the optimal control as a linear function of the inventory. OK, so how is the equivalent solution when using a neural network? So here we have the same problem, but instead of having to optimize for the control new, we have to choose the parameters of the neural network. So we have to choose theta. And theta are weights and biases. If you imagine a, a deep neural network, you have to choose all the weights and biases for this network. So I'm not going to go into the details of the implementation. I'll be happy to go over them with later if someone is interested. Uh, but we use a stochastic optimization algorithm to update um, the, the cost function at the loss function at each. Uh, trading day. So the way it works is that the neural network, we use the same network for all the time steps. So the network is learning at each time step, but also for the whole trading day. So it's going to learn all the time steps as inputs, and it's going to learn how to react to that based on what it's seeing um, in the state variables, so in the price and the inventory and the wealth of the agent. Okay, so I'll leave the details for those interested in the questions, um, but I'll explain really fast. So we, we use a feed forward um, fully connected neural network. So this is a, a simple structure and we use as inputs time and inventory. And the reason why we are using these inputs is coming from the AGB solution, so the, the, the classic solution. They, they uh, have the control as a function of time and the inventory. So we're like, well, let's try the neural network with this first. And, but this can be generalized in many ways. So we can have time, we can have inventory, we can have the wealth, we can have um, uh, the price, we can have many inputs 
but what we use here in the sequence is the risk preference parameters. As I said before, this is a way to avoid retraining the neural network every day. So we can learn from the risk preference parameters. So if you look at this structure, it's not very deep, right? So it's not an extremely deep neural network with hundreds of layers, but it is recurrent. And it's not recurrent uh, as in a, a RNN. So it's recurrent in the sense that we reuse the same structure at each time step. So when we update the weights, it's actually updating for all the time steps uh, at the same time. So here's what it looks like. Uh, in figure two, which should be the first one actually, uh, in figure two we have, so we have the time and the inventory being input to the network, which is gonna output the control. So the control is a function of time and inventory here. And this control is gonna be then input to the dynamics of the problem. So we're gonna generate the next step in, in in state variables. And we're going to repeat this until the end of the trading day. So figure one shows the structure of one step. So we have time and inventory go into the control. The neural network outputs this control. So the neural network is the control. It outputs for each time step a certain amount of stocks to trade. And these go into the dynamics of the problem to output uh, the next state variables. Okay, so how do we train this network? How do we generate sample paths for this? Ideally, we just get data and plug it into the network. But financial data is extremely expensive, as you're probably all familiar with, uh, or it's uh, too scarce. So what we do instead is use transfer learning. We don't want to waste all our data uh, on the amount of training needed for the neural network. So what we do is we simulate uh, data using Monte Carlo. But this data, of course, is based on the real data that we have. So we estimate parameters from the real data to generate the simulated data. So with that data, we generate a first approximation of the neural network. And then we continue the training on real data just so we have uh, fine tuning of the model. Okay, so the data we're actually using here is from Toronto Stock Exchange. We have it from January 2008 to December 2009. It's a lot of trading days. We actually uh, tested for different time periods and the result is the same. So the structure of the data is the same. And we have 19 stocks, but here I'm only gonna show one of them. So the data is in microseconds, but it's asynchronous, meaning that at each trade, we have the information and trades don't happen at interval times. Uh, so in this particular case, since we're interested in risk control and not so much in how to place an order in the limit order book, we're gonna aggregate the trading days into 78 bins of five minutes. Okay, so again, why are we using the neural network? So this is the data we're using. Uh, here's a QQ plot showing that the data has heavy tails. Therefore, we, we should not be using um, the, the Brownian motion, the normal zero one generated uh, diffusion terms. Um, second one is autocorrelation. So since we're dealing with uh, high frequency data, um, the traders that are executing, they're gonna be pushing in one direction. So we might see lags uh, that, that have autocorrelation in this data. And finally, the most important one, uh, which is intraday seasonality. So if you've ever looked at um, intraday data, we have this very classic U-shaped uh, curve for both the spread and the volume and also the volatility. So if, if the spread is larger, of course, you're going to have to cross the book further. So you're going to have a lot more market impact uh, when you trade. Uh, at the same time, if you have more volume, you're going to have less impact uh, on that same limit order book. So keep in mind, like the more, the, the higher the spread, the more you're going to have impact and the higher the volume, the less impact you're going to have. 
So as numerical results, I'll explain the idea of explainability. So explain, explain. Uh, so we have trained the neural network to find the optimal control. We're actually finding the parameters theta. But what does new theta do, right? So this is a crucial question uh, that we should address if we want to have the neural networks being used. So as a reminder, uh, I'm going back to the, the optimal control for gamma equals two. We have this shape that new star is a linear function of the inventory Q. So the idea is that we're going to project the control obtained by the neural network onto the space of linear functions of Q. And of course, if you have a different problem setup, uh, you might want to project it onto more generally the linear space of, of functions of all the state variables, for example. But here uh, we're drawing inspiration from this result. So we only project on linear functions of Q. And the idea of projection is simple. So we use uh, linear regression and we want to find these beta one and beta two terms. And the important part here is the R squared. So how much of our nonlinear functional, so of our neural network can be projected onto the space of closed form controls? So how much are we, um, how much is our function linear or nonlinear? You can put it like that. So how much can we explain of this great variability? So here are the uh, first result. So on the top left, we have H1, which since we don't consider a mean field uh, term, it's only gonna be zero all the time. And then H2, which, so just as a reminder, this is the term we're looking at. Um, the R squared, so here we have everything very close to one, but I wanted to show that it's not perfectly one except for the stylized closed form, which of course, um, is perfectly linear. And finally, the control process mu. So here, what are we looking at? So in blue, we have the stylized closed form, which is the benchmark. So this is coming from the PDE solution. And then we compare the neural network on simulations, meaning we assume everything that the classic closed form assumes in terms of um, Brownian motions are, are normal zero one generated, uh, we don't have seasonality, we don't have real data. So this is a benchmark. And as a benchmark, it's really close in terms of the control. And then we start adding uh, functionality to the code. So we have simulations, but we add seasonality uh, in terms of spread and in terms of volume. So now um, our model starts reacting to the seasonality. So if the spread is larger, uh, we're going to trade a lot less because we don't want to push the price uh, up or down so much. So seasonality here is already having a major impact. And then we add real data to it, which doesn't make that much of a difference. Again, it's just the fine tuning. And, and we add the multi-preference control. So this is when you're actually learning the risk aversion parameters of the agent. So once you're learning that, you actually react a lot. So not trading as much uh, in the beginning of the day because you're still, um, you're still trying to gather what is, uh, on which foot you're standing in the market. Okay, so this result was for gamma equals to two, right? So we keep that uh, quadratic parameter uh, in the objective function. Now, if we look at gamma equals three over two, which would be more realistic in terms of the execution of real traders, we have something more interesting. So I'll skip to the R squared directly. And notice that we're considering different sets of risk version parameters. So the first set is the one that keeps all the execution very similar in terms of um, keeping it similar to gamma equals to two. So we can tune these parameters and, and have very similar execution as to when we had uh, a different gamma. But here, when, it, when we keep 
the exact same parameters and just change the gamma, we quickly see a nonlinear solution for the neural network. So here, uh, as you remember, the R squared was very close to one all the time. Here we're actually taking it from zero to one and we see a very uh, nonlinear structure. So the closer to one, uh, the more it means that this control is linear, but here is very far away. So the neural network is actually learning a nonlinear structure for the control. And of course, we want to know, is this, uh, is this making money or is it not? Uh, is it executing better? So I know it's a lot of plots, but on the left, uh, we have the value function uh, versus the initial inventory. On the right, we have the mark-to-market wealth versus initial inventory. Um, and then on the top, we're considering gamma equals to two. And on the bottom, gamma equals three over two. So I'll go one by one. So the value function versus Q0 for gamma equals two, I compare for all of, all of the possible cases. So stylized closed form, neural network on simulations, add seasonality, add multi-preference control with real data, with seasonality. And they all have a, a very similar type of structure for the value function when gamma equals two. If I then change it to gamma equals three over two, and I compare the stylized closed form um, with the neural network on simulations, we now have something that um, has the neural network outputting uh, a better value function. And of course, this is because we're changing the objective. So we do expect it to be different. Um, and then if we look at the mark-to-market wealth, same thing, it's very similar when gamma equals to two, but once we look at gamma three over two, we notice that the wealth um, is varying a lot less. So for the neural network on simulations, you are actually um, paying less or getting less uh, in terms of how much your wealth uh, is varying mark to market than you would on the stylized closed form. So here you're, you're paying less for uh, each time you trade. So how do we evaluate the performance? We're, we're gonna look at the relative error in the projection. So we take uh, our control. So this is the learned, uh, learned neural network control. And we compare it to the projected version. So we compare it to something that is on, on the manifold of, of uh, linear functions of Q. And on the left, we have uh, gamma equals two. On the right, we're gonna have gamma equals three over two. So if you notice here, so we have initial inventory Q from minus 60,000 to 60,000 stocks. And we have time uh, in bins. So from zero to 78 trading bins. And the relative error here on the Z axis, uh, on the left-hand side, you notice that the error is very small. So it goes until 0.04. And it only increases at the very end of the day. And this happens because um, the less, the more concentrated uh, our inventory is. So once we at, we're at the end of the execution, all the points are very close to zero. So our, our projected version is not as accurate, but that doesn't really matter because we have so little to execute that uh, this error is not no longer relevant. So this execution of let's say 60 stocks is not relevant as it would be if I had 60,000 stocks, right? So here, this is an error that we shouldn't even worry about. And on the other hand, uh, for gamma equals three over two, we have a very large relative error. And this is actually coming from the fact that the neural network is learning something nonlinear. So in the beginning of the trading day is actually doing something very different from what the known control, uh, the classic closed form solution is doing. So while we have shown that it has a better performance, it is something that we don't fully uh, explain in terms of the known solution. So you would have, um, now you have the possibility of discussing this with your risk department. So, do we still want to trade using a neural network? Do we want to set margin for it? 
based on the fact that we know how much, uh, how far away we are from a solution that we are very comfortable with. So this is something that allows for this discussion. And finally, uh, on the multi-preference controller, um, so here I considered the time steps until at least 90% of the order is executed. So if we have uh, parameters that are more uh, that are tighter, we're going to execute much faster. And if we have looser parameters, we might not even finish executing by the end of the day. So this is expected. Uh, but when you look at the left hand side, you're looking at the closed form PD solution. And on the right hand side, you're looking at the neural network solution. And you notice that the neural network solution is always taking a bit longer, uh, at least. Um, dominantly longer to execute than the PD solution for all sets of parameters. And the reason for this is that it's reacting to seasonality. So we're trading less at the beginning of the day where, where the spreads are very large. And therefore we're pushing this trade uh, towards the middle and end of the day. So this is where this is coming from. Um, but either way, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting result to see like, how fast uh, can we execute this order? And, and the best part here is that, well, now I don't have to train the neural network at 4 a.m. Uh, wake me up. Uh, we can input the, our current risk aversion parameters and start trading right away with something that we already trained. And then if you wanna retrain the model once a month, um, that is okay but it, it doesn't have to be something you do every day. Okay, so for conclusion, uh, we propose a neural network based model for optimal execution, uh, which of course allows for um, getting rid of a lot of assumptions uh, from the classic model, assumptions that we, we know for a fact that don't hold in real data. And then we propose uh, explainability through this projection idea, uh, which uses a linear regression. And we propose a multi-preference version of the same problem, which allows to remove a bit of the computational burden that you would have. Uh, I wanna do some propaganda. So I have other papers in this thesis. Uh, first one is a theoretical bound for the projection. So here we have shown numerically how this projection works. And on, a, on the next paper, we're gonna show uh, the, th the theory behind it. So we're gonna make it more robust and, and explain uh, this explainability idea and, and how these bounds actually work. And the second paper is the model improvement through high frequency econometric tests. So we use both regular, uh, regularly sampled data and on time asynchronous trading data to show that um, the inventory process is actually not just time differentiable, it has a diffusion component. And of course I have other projects. So this one has become a paper. So price avalanche is in product repricing. Um, I'm currently working on graph networks in limit order books. And of course we can use this neural network approximation idea for many other financial problems. So the most interesting one for me is the, it's the hedging problem, but of course you can find a, a myriad of other problems in this area. So this paper you can find on archive and the financial, the, the high frequency econometrics paper as well. The other ones, oh, actually this one you can already find, but it's not related to the stock. And, and this one will come out soon. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, you can ask now or send me an email later at lleal at princeton.edu. So thank you. I hope I didn't go over the time. Oh. Oh, no, actually we have plenty of time. And so I had a couple questions in the chat then, uh, and maybe I'll ask a question or two. And in the meantime, if ever, anyone has other questions, please add them in there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had a first question, which was, is the speed of trading limited by the neural network latency? So I'm thinking that they're asking 
if in the model there's a sort of latency or slowness to it, but maybe you could comment just on maybe the, the speed of the neural networks and whether this is something that would work well live or whether it's, as you said, something you train uh, in free. Yeah, so this is something that you would train offline. So this is not per se re online reinforcement learning. So you would wait until the end of the trading day to update all the weights. So you would not be limited by latency here because you, you have trained ahead of time. So pretty much to simplify, uh, and by the way, I really like your demystification of neural networks that sometimes, um, sometimes seems more complicated than it is, but you've clarified things. Um, ultimately, it takes in time and inventory and potentially uh, risk aversion parameters, but... Yes. But ultimately, once this neural network has been trained on past data, that's all it does is it just uh, inputs, it takes these two inputs and spits out uh, a rate. Yes, um, it's, it's ready for use. So that's what I meant as in, well, once you have uh, your objective function and your dynamics uh, really accurate, then all you need to do is just obtain the control and start trading. So you don't need to worry about like what's under the hood. It, it doesn't really matter to the person trading. It only matters to implement it once. So and, the, the end user uh, doesn't need to know what's going on. And so as this is used intraday, do you expect the risk aversion to be uh, tweaked over the course of the day or who would control that? Or that's an out, it's an out, it's just a, an arbitrary input. You could, you could do it. Uh, the person who would control it is actually the trader. Okay. So, yeah. so your risk aversion might be a knob that speeds or, or, or sort of slows down the process. Yes. Okay. Um, I had another question, which was, um, can you elaborate the fine tuning procedure in the, uh, so maybe I should say the names. Uh, this is, this, the other question was Kevin Defogan. And this one is from Zhu Yuan Yao, who asks, can you elaborate the fine tuning procedure in the transfer learning part? Yeah, so here, uh, this, is, this is something that we, we debated a lot. Um, and there's, so once the, the network converges, and of course, there are no theoretical uh, explanation. There, there are no theoretical results that to say like, well, has it converged? Um, but once we have um, we have the the result not changing for a very long time, so for many iterations, uh, then we assume that it has converged. And once we reach that step, uh, we instead of using um, Monte Carlo generated increments, we start using uh, the real data. So, in, so the increments are now coming directly from the increments we calculate from Toronto Stock Exchange. So that meaning that now every component of um, heavy tails, every component of autocorrelation is now taken into account. And then we train, we continue the training on this data. So I don't know if you're asking about the, the actual um, implementation, but the way this implementation is done is through checkpoints on TensorFlow. So what a checkpoint does is it records the last, uh, the last weight and bias, and you can continue your training from that, that particular point uh, of the training. So you train, save the checkpoint, and then retrieve the checkpoint to continue training on another side of, of the project. So I hope this answers both sides of the question. Yeah. Um, so I've got a, a good a question I like as well from Alberto Chap Chap, who says, do you perform any kind of pre-processing in the input variables, i.e. time and inventory? And what function is the neural network op optimizing exactly? 
Uh, I don't know if you. Yes, have yes, that, that's a there, good but... question. Um, so th these are two questions, right? So the first one, uh, do I perform anything before? Yes. So the neural network, when it takes, uh, for example, the inventory as input, if we had used um, the input as the pure value of the inventory, let's say like 60,000, and we use time as um, time between zero and one, let's say from, from an interval, then the neural network would not learn very well. It would have uh, training issues because of the difference uh, between the, the size of the variables. So what we do is that we have instead the inventory as a proportion of uh, the average volume for that stock during a day. So let's say we're not trading um, 50,000 stocks, we're trading 5% uh, of the daily volume. So once when we input into the neural network, it's taken as a value between uh, minus one and one because we could be trading the other direction. So it could be neg negative. Um, but once we put it back into the dynamics, we change it uh, to actual values. So when we put it in the neural network is a proportion and when we put it into the dynamics is an actual value that you're trading. So that is one question. Sorry, can you remind me of the second one? Yeah, the second one was what function is the neural network optimizing exactly? So maybe they're okay, looking yes. for the objective, um, the objective function. So here, so here you have a maximization problem. You have the objective function and you have dynamics. If you, if you were to solve uh, this maximization problem, it would output a control. So this control being new uh, data. So the function that we're looking for is a function of time and inventory. And what we're outputting here is what are the weights and biases. And the structure of this function is actually here. So once we input time and inventory, these are uh, weights and biases, which are our theta, right? So this is the structure of the function. Um, and, and this is what it's out. So this is the problem we want to solve. And we set a structure for the neural network. And the output is actually going to be uh, this function but tweaked for weights and biases in the problem. So this is, this is the, the, instead of using the neural network in the classic way, like saying, uh, well, it is, you have a training set and a test set. This is using its most um, intrinsic form of function approximation. So we don't have, a training set, a testing set, what we're doing is approximating the solution to the stochastic optimization problem. And so is it fair to say that there's sort of two input nodes and in these four hidden layers or what, what, is there a diagram that sort of corresponds to this in, in, in neural network land? <laughs> I don't have it in these slides, uh -huh. but yes. <laughs> it seems like it, so, there's this structure is more like a, a snake biting its tail, right? It's sort of like... Um, yeah, so this, this would be a very simple structure, just like, uh, just like you have the nodes and you have the inputs, you have the nodes, and then you have one output that is the control to mm -hmm. the speed of trading. So you put in time and inventory, you output how fast should you trade in this five minute bin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this, what we have this equation right here is sort of telling us about the architecture that yes. you chose. Yes. Okay, um, so we've got a question um, by Michael Sotiropoulos, which uh, mm -hmm. actually I know him Hi, quite Michael. well. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, in fact, I, I was going to ask a, a version of this uh, question myself. So he asks, can we interpret the difference between the two control solutions, gamma equal to two and gamma to three halves as a result of the changing of the utility of the investor? And I guess my version of this question would be, do we know for sure that gamma two is not great and three halves is a better uh, model of an investor or, or what is our evidence that we like? So, yeah, the, so you know, feel so, free to address both questions, but we're kind of both dancing around the question of how, is, is gamma two and three halves a fundamentally different uh, animal? Mm -hmm. so, so of course it's, uh, it's gonna be a difference changing the utility function. So if we have a different utility function, that's a different uh, stochastic optimization problem that we're solving. So the control could be um, just reflecting that fact. But what we are saying is that with the new, um, with the new setup, with the new framework with gum equals two, we no longer have a closed farm solution coming from a PDE, for example, uh, we will have an approximated solution coming from the neural network. And, okay, so then the question becomes, okay, why three over two? So this is something that is not, um, it's not out there, it's not published. This is something that comes from uh, the experience of one of my co-authors. He tested this for actual uh, trader's execution within uh, the firm he was working at. So here I don't have uh, an explanation coming from the data that we have. It's just a heuristic explanation. Okay. Um, then we have someone, Spencer Dean, who says, I know this is a stupid question, good start, um, but do you have any idea what the network is doing at the times when it can't be well projected to a linear control strategy? What kinds of positions is it taking at these times? How are they changing? Uh, I know that it's fundamentally non-parametric, so it's probably challenging, if not impossible, but he's asking the question anyways. Okay. Um, so we do know what the network is doing. Um, we have, we have the, the trajectory for the execution. Um, what kind of positions is taking, hardly changing? We have all that. So if you look, if you look here, uh, the average control process new, we actually have uh, this process for the network. So this is the speed of trading at each given time from zero to 78 bins. Um, so we do know what it's doing. It's trading at this speed. Um, so the time, yeah, so I don't know. I think this answer is like around the time 50, 60, which I guess is the worrisome bit, mm -hmm. uh, where something is, the R squared is poor. And oh, that, so here, that here's mean, not actually the cont average control process seems to be going the wrong way as far as the optimal solution is concerned? Is that so? So here for gamma equals two, they're actually all very close to one. So this is just a matter of, uh, this is 0 0.997. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so here it's very, very close to one. And, and the process is just saying, uh, here we're starting to trade faster. It's not that we're going in the other direction. Here's just it was trading a bit slower because in, in the middle of the trading day, there's not much volume and the spreads are large. So we're, we're reacting to that. And then we're picking up again towards the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the question might actually be here, but here we cannot see it as well. So um, the R squared is actually um, saying that the solution is nonlinear, but in the average control process, uh, we have a very uh, non-aggressive execution leaving it for the next day. So yeah, we do know what the control is doing at each given point of the day. 
Um, and we do know how it's changing. So it's, it's not impossible. One thing to keep in mind though, uh, and I know it's not related to the question, but here we're looking at the average control process and the neural network is very good at outputting uh, this type of like expectation result. But when you're trading, you're actually looking at one trajectory. So while the average control process uh, is, is a great guide on how your execution is gonna look like, uh, once we go to one trajectory, um, it might not be exactly how, uh, it might not be exactly this shape. So there's something to keep in mind. I know it's not related to the question, but it's something that we have discussed uh, a few times uh, between the co-authors. And if someone has inputs on this, I would love to hear if you're a trader or have used these methods before. Okay, and so I guess there's one last question and we're wrapping up the hour. So sounds like a perfect final one. Uh, Domenico Spoto is asking, as an optimization method, did you consider using a two block method slash decomposition for the W and the B? So W and B, I guess, are your weights and your biases. And I don't fully understand the question, but the, the question is, uh, did you consider a two block method or decomposition for so them? I also don't fully understand the question, but I did not consider a two block method. I would love to hear more about it if, if Domenico could uh, okay. say uh, more about it. <laughs> oh, we've got a final one from Marcos, uh, uh, a, a fellow uh, Brazilian, I think, Marcos Carreira. Oh. Uh, what could this method learn from GME and other uh, meme stocks? Would the dynamic have to change? <laughs> well, here, <laughs> here, yes, uh, you would need to change. Um, let's see if I, oh, I didn't bring this slide, but you would need to change uh, the way you're impacting the price. So here. Uh, this is you impacting the price, but if you have uh, a mean field game of agents, so if you have a meme stock, you would be considering like many people acting and pushing this price in one direction. So instead of having the control as being you pushing the price, it would be you plus uh, a mean field game of agents pushing the price. And then how this would change um, the solution would be that instead of having this H1 is nearly zero uh, in, in every case, you would have this H1 uh, an, as an actual function of time. So you would have this, this guy changing. So yes, yeah, so it, it, the dynamics changes, uh, change a bit and you would have a different, uh, slightly different solution. So thanks, thanks. this is a fun question. <laughs> Okay. Well, I don't know if uh, Rene Carmona is in the audience, but I'm sure he would like the answer with the meme. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, well, uh, great to have you. Thank you so much Thank for you. this uh, great presentation. And uh, I guess we'll continue the seminar in the new year. Thanks for having me, Sasha. And thanks for everyone who came and asked questions. <laughs>